on who um is correct but he's he's only technically correct um he he tends not to be uh he tends not at all um to be uh about other things um i mean you're gonna declare war on me anyway when you go super saiyan so whatever come at me dwarf Because the, the big, I'll put it this way. I'll put it this way. One of the most dramatic things that happens between Slon that we know of is that Lord Lord Quex gets into such a nasty argument with the other Slon. Um, granted, Mazda Mundi, we don't know what Mazda Mundi's personal opinion of this debate was, but there was an argument between two of the Slon. Uh, it was Lord Kex and I forget who the other one was, um, but they were having this big debate about if they should realign the um if they should realign the continents or if they should just uh leave it as is and it was such a heated debate between the two of them that just the like the mental strain caused by their argument um so like the 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 basically the like ethereal pressure in the atmosphere started to go up um, to the point that numerous lizardmen, uh, there were like a, a lot of notable sightings of like lightning spontaneously appearing and like weird multicolored lights and like random uh, conflagrations of fire and all this other shit. So like magical phenomena was just occurring because the two of them were having like, the two of them were having such an intense debate and they were so angry at each other having this like full on like well actually debate that they were getting just absolutely furious um they were getting so pissed about it and um when lord kex finally finally won the argument uh and was reportedly very smug about his win um all of the other slon all of them every single other slon was was so like i guess irritated with the way he acted after winning uh presumably more than his actual victory um that they all refused to speak to him for i think two centuries um hold on let, let me find the actual quote because it's really funny like it's, it's just kind of like a perfect uh thing of like pettiness um among the slon which i just find very amusing uh let me find it Yeah, Lord Quex, uh, next is re realignment. Like the slaughter, mostly okay with it, but he does he does apparently get into a little bit of trouble. Let me find it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. So. Um. So here, so here, here's, here's the overall quote about it. Um, over the coming centuries, the meditations of the slum were riven with turmoil. Many counts, counts, counseled, sorry, that no further realignments should yet be made. They pondered while in the world beyond Lustria, the Sundering split the Elven kingdoms in twain, uh, and Caradryl called the Peacemaker became Phoenix King. Others, notably those of the more recent spawnings, voiced the opinion that action should be taken sooner and that errors should be corrected while there was still time. Uh... Two of the mage priests engaged in what to the Slon was a raging and bitter dispute. Lord Quex of Pahox believed that a drastic realignment was now overdue and that it should be instigated right away. Lord Itzok of Itza believed that no such realignment should be undertaken. Each lay recumbent on his throne while attendants wiped saliva from his lips, yet the sublime communion resonated to the sound of their argument. At length, the debate escalated into a manner of arcane duel. Mystical lightning arced from the tops of temple pyramids, the air became charged... Um, as magical pressure grew to staggering proportions and the beasts of the jungle bellowed in anger and confusion. Then in an instant, the matter was decided and the debate was won. The will of Lord Kex prevailed 
and calling upon the staggering reservoirs of power within the geomantic web the mage priest caused the continents to move uh which has just like earthquakes struck every corner of the globe due to this sky castles tumbled in the mountains of morn and a ragged breach appeared in the great bastion of cathay through which a hundred thousand vengeful hung marauders swarmed the lands about ancient Kazvar were blasted apart before being drowned by the sea. Worst hit of all were the World's Edge Mountains, for beneath this range was found the great underway of the Dwarf Empire. Lava surged up from the world's depths to flood the halls of the dwarfs, and untold numbers were incinerated in an instant. Um, <laughs> the continent of Lustry itself was not spared the destruction. The Great Pyramid of Itza, atop which sat Lord Ixalk, collapsed to the ground, killing the mage priest in an instant. The venerable mage priest death sent shockwaves resounding through the sublime communion, violently awaking the meditating slon. Soon after, word came that amongst the rubble of Itzlok's pyramid had been found the lost, long lost plaque of Otzlipotek. This, the awakened mage priest of Itza ordered this plaque be brought before them, and having read it, they pronounced that Lord Quex had been correct in his interpretation of the will of the old ones. The realignments would continue the slon priest order no matter the cost, lest the Lizardman race ever stray from the true path or deviate the great plan of the old ones. Oh no, I think it's I think it's a dimp different mage priest who gets into trouble. Uh oh god, I gotta find him. Because I it's just it's it's so petty the way they talk about it, which I always find super funny. Uh where is he? Like the, the Lizardman can be surprisingly petty of a faction. Like in the year 2100. Skink priests attending to the mummified remains of Lord Chili Peppa dispute the meaning of the flight patterns of mosquitoes circling his skeletal head. The disagreement escalates and opposing factions clash over possession of the remains. So like there was a civil war in one of the Lizardman cities over the possession of a relic priest. Uh, let's see. Where is the guy that everybody gets salty with? I don't think it's in this book. Maybe it's in this book. Uh, let's see. Oh yeah, yeah, here it is. The Great Debate. The Great Debate in uh, 2374 BIC, so before Imperial Calendar. So 2,774 years before the formation of the empire. Lord Hua Hua of Zlanhapek claims victory in a 500 year old debate about what to do about the younger races. No other Slan speaks to Lord Hua Hua for the next thousand years in protest. <laughs> like they had a 500, imagine arguing with someone for 500 years and eventually it's agreed they won the argument. But everyone was apparently so pissed at you winning the argument that everyone then refuses to speak to you for the next 1,000 years. Like how much of a how much of a smug dick do you have to be that no one speaks to you for a millennia? <laughs> That's a pretty obscene period of time. Sure is damn funny though. Did I hear correctly? Flight patterns about mosquitoes caused a civil... Yeah, I, well, you have to understand that when you're not dealing with the slon, most lizardmen are, like, very superstitious. Um, especially skinks. Skinks are very prone to, like, what the slon consider idiot things. Um, the, the slon often tend to find the skinks very exasperating because the skinks are very prone to believing in very stupid things. Um, that are like as far as the it's like the slon viewed as like pseudoscience i guess he wanted to spare the younger races uh it's likely that it's not it's it's not so much that he probably wanted to spare them and the others didn't he probably felt that isolation was the best plan which the other lizardmen probably found uncomfortable
Because, like, skinks, skinks love the kind of shit where it's like, ah, we can determine that um, by the, the path these birds are flying in, that that means something important's about to happen or the old ones are angry or the old, or we should make we should make great offerings to the old ones by capturing our enemies and brutally ripping out their hearts and offering what's left to our gods um which the slaughter just like dude that's not oh my fucking god like that's not how that's that that does nothing that literally does nothing like the old ones were not gods they are just whatever like we can't like the, the salon honestly cannot be bothered most of the time to deal with it um but that's often the kind of shit they're dealing with skinks are idiots yeah a little bit they mean well they they, they mean well but they're, they're they're a little they're a little dumb Yeah, I'm gonna need those warfire throwers to s stop. When in doubt, throw a meteor. Yep, that'll do it. That'll do it. Oh, thanks for the hydrate, guys. I really appreciate when y'all remind me about stuff like hydration, because I will forget. But I'm not a smart man. And most of my brain power goes towards silly things like remembering a lot of random nonsense about a fictional universe. Oh, Aztec, um, hold up before you go to bed. Oh, yeah, no, that's that's kind of what I'm thinking too. It, it definitely looks like some kind of long neck dinosaur, though probably not nearly as hideous as whatever the hell that thing is you sent me. Uh, but yeah, no, it, it definitely looks like it's some kind of bipedal long neck thing I would, I would agree with that absolutely song mage good to see you how you doing uzu score taker can i get a lore fact on sea lord island oh yeah dude uh did y'all know that once upon a time uh i want to say it was like wasn't crazy long ago i want to say it was like uh, was it like 200 years ago? Uh, I am. Where is my I am? There it is. Uh, let's see. So he got in trouble once. Yeah. Uh, so it was in 800 or 181. So it was a, it was a, it was roughly 150 years ago. Yeah, 170 years ago. So 170 years before the modern day. Uh, sea Lord Iceland actually got in a little bit of political, well, no, a lot a bit of political trouble um, because, so uh, Ulthuan had been attacked. Um, Lord Mazdamundi communes, my lord, yet his words are greatly weakened at this distance. The geomantic web, the fundamental power network of your cold-blooded kind must be accessed directly. Ooh, the hand of the gods. I do like, I do like that hand. Um, um, but, uh, basically what he did is that he discovered, um, that a, uh, a pirate, uh, a pirate who 
was from Marienburg, uh, successfully managed to attack and raid Ulthuan. Um, so he successfully managed to navigate the mists on the eastern shore, and he navigated his way to Ulthuan, where he uh, sacked one of the cities and made off with a whole bunch of money, uh, thinking himself super clever and, uh, you know, having outwitted uh, the elves. But when good old, uh, when good old Big Daddy Sea Lord Island found out, he was understandably pissed. Uh, and he did not want to just deal with the pirate. He wanted to send a message um, to the city of Marienburg that Ulthuan was not available for messing with. Uh, that if they wanted to, uh, if they wanted to mess with, uh, they make them think twice about allowing like a pirate who had messed with Ulthuan into their um, city because obviously they didn't really have a problem with it. Like he came and uh, his uh, um, he set up camp basically in Marienburg and was just acting like, oh, I'm home. Like I'm so cool and awesome. Uh, so what did Iceland do? Well, Iceland showed up and he immediately... Uh, called upon his troops to go into the city and uh, he started setting fire to all the ships. Uh, oh, who was the pirate? Uh, the pirate lord was named... Hold on. You know what? I'll just, I'll just read the segment. Easier. Sack of Marienburg. Guided by luck more than judgment, Otto Steinroth, the infamous red pirate of Marienburg, led a mighty fleet through Ulthuan's mist. His wolf-proud ships laid waste to the city of Sardaneth, and his crews plundered its treasures. Thus did Steinroth's ships depart for home far wealthier than they had arrived. With these deeds did the Red Pirate bring woe upon the city of Marienburg, for he earned the wrath of Sea Lord Islan, whose fleet had come to Sardaneth's aid too late. Islan's ships were swift and could easily have overtaken the Red Pirate and destroyed him at sea, but the Sea Lord was determined to set an example not soon forgotten by the upstart race of man. So it was that he shadowed Steinroth's ships across the stormy seas, using every ounce of nautical cunning at his command to remain undetected. Only when the Red Pirate's fleet was berthed once more alongside Marienburg's uh, Gilderveld docks did Iceland strike. As the battle began, the gunners in Marienburg's coastal fortresses, long practiced though they were at repelling raids from Bretonia and Norska, found their aim cheated by an inexplicable mist that swept over the Reich's mouth the instant the first shot was fired. Under the cover of the mist, the High Elf Fleet took up blockade formation and began bombardment of the port. Iceland's flagship, the Brine Dragon, its gunwales filled to bursting with the finest warriors of Lothern, sailed full into the harbor and disgorged his troops along the dockside. Had the Marienburgers known the reasons for Iceland's attack, they might well have stood aside and allowed his vengeance to proceed unimpeded, the better to end the blockade of their city. As it was, they knew only that their home was afire and that elven warriors marched in their streets. Thus, Iceland's warriors found their path to Steinroth's wolf prowls blocked not only by the Red Pirate's ro rogue curs, but some of Nordland's finest troops. So began a confused battle along the dockside. The elves had the better of it from the start, for the mist was of their making and thus little impediment to their eyes. It was soon too much for the Red Pirate's men, who had no taste for fighting on the losing side. When Steinroth himself was cut down by Iceland's blade, the survivors threw down their blades and dove into the water to escape. Yet there was no escape there from Iceland's keen-eyed archers. The will of the pirates might have been broken, but the soldiers of Marienburg fought on with all the desperation of men defending their home. Handguns coughed and boomed as Nordland marksmen vainly searched for targets in the mist. The harbor rang with the clash of steel upon steel as halberdiers and swordsmen sought to drive the elves from the quayside. Yet as they fought in vain, little by little, the high elves scoured the docks around the wolf prows. As the Lothern Sea Guard formed spear walls to secure the quayside, other elves boarded the wolf prows and retrieved all that was truly valuable. valuable. Books of ancient lore, scepters and circlets of rule, and the weapons of Sardanes princes. Then, at Iceland's command, the elves retreated to the Brine Dragon, taking with them only not only their dead, but also a large number of extremely vocal and angry elven merchants, whose stores of fine wine and eastern silks would now have to be abandoned. No elf could hope to remain in Marienburg after that day's deeds. As Iceland's flagship returned his fleet, he turned back towards Marienburg with narrowed eyes. He gave a sharp nod to the mages assembled upon the foredeck, and they called down a conflagration of living flame upon the dark dockside. The fires quickly spread from ship to jetty and from jetty to warehouse, consuming all in their path. By the time the Brine Dragon had reached open sea, all of Marienburg's merchant fleet and much of the city's hoarded wealth had been reduced to ashes upon the wind. Iceland returned to a mixed reception on Ulthuan. The kin of those slain at Sardaneth hailed him as a hero, as did those princes who believed in the power of the High Elves should be felt more keenly in other lands. 
many others, especially those who had benefited greatly from trade with Marienburg, declaimed Iceland's actions as unnecessarily ruthless and nothing short of declaration of war. In the months following the sack of Marienburg, the sea lord standing at court diminished to almost nothing. The situation was not helped by Iceland prosecuting new campaigns of reciprocity against Norse settlements. Ironically, the same actions that isolated the sea lord amongst the courts of Ulthuan soon drew him closer to the Phoenix King, for Finnebar saw a ruthlessness in Iceland that Ulthuan could ill afford to lose. And then about 10 years later, um, Ulthuan would actually... Uh, a Hyo fleet under the command of Admiral Ethelis uh, uh, the White ended up uh, destroying a Norskan fleet that was blockading Marienburg and trade resumed between those uh, to those places. Uh, Shubsakom May, welcome to the stream. How you doing? Need to high cheered. X one hundred. Dark Elves legendary hero will be Kane Inkerid. Is Finnebar a good Phoenix King? Yeah, he's a, he's he's a very good Phoenix King. He's very reasonable. Um, there are some in the court that are not terribly fond of him, um, for various reasons. Uh, but I would say overall he is a good king. Yes, he's one of the only. He is like the only Phoenix King who has actually traveled, like the most of the entire world. The Dark Elf Legendary Hero will be the Kane Incarnate. Um, it, it could be. I, I think a better Legendary Hero would be Corin Darkhand, to be honest, because he's he's kind of more of a lackey character. Like, he's defined by kind of his service to other characters uh, more than, like, leading armies on his own. Actually, when it comes to, like, leading his own armies or, like, being, like, the big guy in charge, he's actually been fairly unsuccessful um, a lot of the time. Uh, he seems to do much better when it's uh, when he is like taking orders from someone else, because uh, he, he's he's usually Malekith's guy. Um, but in any event, um, I think he would make a better legendary hero than uh, the character you're referring to. Um, uh, oh my gosh. I cannot remember his name for the life of me all of a sudden. Ah, it'll come to me at some point. Or someone in chat will know, remember. Is Tyrion your technically stronger than Finnebar? Uh, yeah. Fin Finnebar's not the greatest warrior among the elves. Yeah, Talar's Dreadbringer. Thank you. Um, like, Finnebar... Finnebar is a skilled fighter. But, like, he, he can hold his own in a fight. Uh, we have actually seen him in his full like raiment of war so to speak but generally speaking it is not his forte um and it's certainly not what he's like well known slash famous for uh he definitely is a character that tends to um be much more heavily focused on uh as a he he's much more of a political figure than he is anything else. Um, he is a, he's an excellent politician. He's an excellent king and he can hold his own in a fight, but he's not, he's not as nearly as good as Tyrion is in a fight. And he's not a wizard. Um, I don't believe he's ever demonstrated any notable capacity for casting spells. Is there a temple city devoted to Haunchy? Yes. Um, yes, it's, it's the city that Oxyodal, um is notably from and we actually have a note about that uh which is when the chameleon skinks started spawning again because the chameleon skinks basically went extinct for a while um uh let's see yes here you go Chameleon skinks are an unusual spawning that for many ages were, were thought to have become extinct. They originate exclusively from the sacred spawning pools of Pahawks, a temple city destroyed soon after the fall of the Polar Gates, and it was thought that the last of their kind was slain in the Battle of Blood Ravine. Um, however, beginning the Age of Strife, a few haphazard spawnings occurred across Lustre, and in recent years they have proliferated at rates never before seen. The fact that they have spontaneously began to spawn again 
has been inter uh, interpreted in many ways by the skink priests. It is assumed to be part of the old one's great plan, but whether the proliferation is due to the growing chaos threat or because the old ones deemed that chameleon skinks would be needed for the lizardmen to once more expand their realm is mere speculation. Uh, but yes, Pahox, Pahox is generally, which it's known as the city of, uh, I think it's the city of ashes is what it's known at nowadays or known as at nowadays. But uh, it is considered like the city of Hanji. Um, and that is indeed where Oxyodal is from. Uh, the heck is it? It's a total Stubatoon, Oxyol, Yodel, Axlodel. Quetza, Chakwa, Zlonhapek, Fox, Quaddle, Bahatek, Quitax, Foxlon, Foxla, Spectazuma. Oh, there it is. Pahox, the city of Ash. Yeah. Pahox is the city of Ash. Yeah. Will this campaign also be on the second channel? Uh, sure. Why not? Why not? Yeah, we can do that. Right, I will let you hold the desert for now, Kalita, but don't make me regret it. Oh, jeez. Yes, the la I absolutely and one hundred percent believe the last Lizardman Legendary Lord should be Teto Echo. Uh huh. Beat H seven. Good to see you, dude. How you been? Cetra wants to be friends. Yeah, we could be friends, Cetra. The tomb. The tomb kings will make useful allies, considering we're surrounded by baddies. Luckily, the Wood Elves and the Dwarf should slap each other around a little bit. Now, oh, and the Vampire counts. Let them fight amongst one another, but the Lizardmen will rise supreme. Could Sam make another Slong character? Uh, yeah, I mean, they could. There's quite a few of them. There, there, there is a ton of Slong characters who could easily rise up to be Legendary Lord status. There's Lord Kex. There's Lord uh, Chili Peppa. There's, um, oh my gosh. Um, there's Lord Kex, Lord Chili Peppa, Lord... Uh, let's see, there's the one that has to do with Shawcox. What's his name? Uh, is it the Nether City? Or the Nether Thing story, I think. Uh, yes, there is Lord uh, Huininit. Huintin. Oh, God, his name is fucking impossible to say. There is Lord Huinitinukli. Who is the boss of Lord Tanukli? <laughs> who went into Tanukli? Yeah. 
uh, which Lord who went into Tanukli is actually interesting because he's from Pahox. Like he actually survived the fall of the city, which is a pretty interesting little thing. But like you could do him 